In other words, UFOs are actually real, and apparently so is extraterrestrial life. Now we know. In a normal country, this news would qualify as a bombshell, the story of the millennium. But in our country, it doesn't. Higher UFO phenomenon. Okay, we've had a problem here. Hey, it's Tucker Carlson. This morning, it looks like somebody blew up the Kakovka Dam in southern Ukraine. The rushing wall of water wiped out entire villages, destroyed a critical hydropower plant, and as of tonight, puts the largest nuclear reactor in Europe in danger of melting down. So if this was intentional, it was not a military tactic, it was an act of terrorism. The question is, who did it? Well, let's see. The Kokovka Dam was effectively Russian. It was built by the Russian government. And it currently sits in Russian-controlled territory. The dam's reservoir supplies water to Crimea, which has been, for the last 240 years, home of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. Blowing up the dam may be bad for Ukraine, but it hurts Russia more. And for precisely that reason, the Ukrainian government has considered destroying it. In December, the Washington Post quoted a Ukrainian general saying his men had fired American-made rockets at the dam's floodgate as a test strike. So really, once the facts start coming, it becomes much less of a mystery what might have happened to the dam. Any fair person would conclude that the Ukrainians probably blew it up, just as you would assume they blew up Nord Stream, the Russian natural gas pipeline, last fall. And in fact, the Ukrainians did do that, as we now know. It's not like Vladimir Putin is anxious to wage war on himself. Oh, but that's where you're wrong, Mr. and Mrs. Cable News consumer. Vladimir Putin is exactly that sort of man, the sort of man who'd shoot himself to death in order to annoy you. We know this from the American media, which wasted no time this morning in accusing the Russians of sabotaging their own infrastructure. Bill Kristol, the man who once told us that Saddam Hussein was responsible for 9-11, immediately denounced Putin as a war criminal and even more savagely compared him to Donald Trump. The rest of the pundit class made similar, clearly coordinated noises. Putin did it! Putin did it! And their reasoning was simple. Putin is evil, and evil people do evil things purely for the dark joy of being evil. In this specific case, Putin attacked himself, which is the most evil thing you can do, and therefore perfectly in character for a man that evil. That was their explanation. No one who's paid to cover these things seemed to entertain even the possibility it could have been Ukrainians who did it. No chance of that. Ukraine, as you may have heard, is led by a man called Zelensky. We can say for a dead certain fact that he was not involved. He couldn't have been. Zelensky is too decent for terrorism. Now, you see him on television, and it's true you might form a different impression. Sweaty, like a comedian turned oligarch, a persecutor of Christians, a friend of BlackRock but don't believe your own eyes. Actually, Mr. Zelensky is a very good man. The best, really. As George W. Bush once noted, he is our generation's Winston Churchill. Of all the people in the world, our shifty, dead-eyed Ukrainian friend in the tracksuit is uniquely incapable of blowing up a dam. He's literally a living saint, a man in whom there is no sin. That's why Lindsey Graham is so attracted to him. They're just two good people hanging out together and being good. And like all good people, when they meet in person, they spend a lot of time talking about killing people and laughing like friends do. Here's the pair last week. Free or die. Free or die. Now you are free. Yes. And we will be. And the Russians are dying. It's the best money we've ever spent. Thank you so much. No, it's... The Russians are dying. It's the best money we've ever spent, Graham says. A smile spreads across his thin, quivering lips as he forms the words. He looks like a starving man contemplating a breakfast buffet. The aroma of has aroused Lindsey Graham. Thanks so much, replies Zelensky. He feels the same way. See, there's nothing dark here. Just two middle-aged guys celebrating the killing of a population. They don't seem like the kind of people who'd enjoy flooding villages or starting a famine. And in any case, who cares if they are? It's really not your business. Your job is to support Ukraine. Watch Nikki Haley, a Republican candidate for president, explain this principle on CNN. A win for Ukraine 
is a win for all of us. And for them to sit there and say that this is a territorial dispute, that's just not the case. To say that we should stay neutral, it is in the best interest of America. It's in the best interest of our national security for Ukraine to win. We have to see this through. We have to finish it. See, it's very easy to understand. It is vitally important for you to support Ukraine because it's necessary for Ukraine to be supported by you. Your support is mandatory until it's finished, whatever it is and whatever that means. So shut up and support Ukraine or else you're in trouble. Back when they still taught logic, statements like this were known as tautologies. Something is true because it is. The more you repeat it, the truer it becomes. It's a self-reinforcing reality. There was a time when tautologies were considered illegitimate arguments, not to mention hilarious. Only people talk like that. Now everybody in power talks like that. Diversity is our strength. Zelensky is Churchill. It's all self-evidently true. Doesn't need an explanation and don't ask questions. Sound familiar? Of course it does. That's the PAP they're serving us day after day in steaming lumpy portions. By this point, it's possible that American citizens are the least informed people in the world. Your average yak herder in Tajikistan knows who blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. It's obvious. And of course, we have been. The media lie. They do. But mostly, they just ignore the stories that matter. What's happened to the hundreds of billions of US dollars we've sent to Ukraine? No clue. Who organized those BLM riots three years ago? No one's gotten to the bottom of that. What exactly happened on 9-11? Well, it's still classified. How did Jeffrey Epstein make all that money? How did he die? How about JFK? And so endlessly on. Not only are the media not interested in any of this, they are actively hostile to anybody who is. In journalism, curiosity is the gravest crime. Yesterday, for example, a former Air Force officer who worked for years in military intelligence came forward as a whistleblower to reveal that the U.S. government has physical evidence of crashed non-human made aircraft, as well as the bodies of the pilots who flew those aircraft. The Pentagon has spent decades studying these otherworldly remains in order to build more technologically advanced weapons systems. Okay, that's what the former intel officer revealed, and it was clear he was telling the truth. In other words, UFOs are actually real, and apparently so is extraterrestrial life. Now we know. In a normal country, this news would qualify as a bombshell, the story of the millennium. But in our country, it doesn't. The whistleblower's account ran on a technology website called The Debrief, which you've probably never heard of. The Washington Post had that story, but decided not to run it. The New York Times, meanwhile, just pretended it never happened. On the front page of the New York Times website this morning, there were five stories about Ukraine, as well as four stories apiece about Donald Trump, trans people, and climate change, the usual lineup. There was nothing at all about how an alien species is flying hypersonic aircraft over our cities. Not one word. So if you're wondering why our country seems so dysfunctional, this is a big part of the reason. Nobody knows what's happening. A small group of people control access to all relevant information, and the rest of us don't know. But go ahead and talk about something that really matters and see what happens. If you keep it up, they'll make you be quiet. Trust us. That's how they maintain control. When Western tourists first started traveling in large numbers to the Soviet Union in the early 1970s, they found that many Russians had a completely warped understanding of the United States. They thought that Americans lived in grinding poverty in a state of perpetual race war and were desperate to flee to the freedom and prosperity of the Eastern Bloc. They thought this because that's what they had been told. They had no way to know otherwise. The few Russians who understood what was really going on in the rest of the world had learned about it from listening to shortwave radio broadcasts, sometimes under the cover so the neighbors wouldn't hear. 50 years later, it is bewildering to consider the ironies here. We're the ones who live in ignorance now. The U.S. government has managed to classify more than a billion so-called public documents. So at this point, we can't possibly know what our leaders are doing. We're not allowed to know. By definition, that is not a democracy. Yet it's fine with the media. Secrecy is a powerful tool of control. Stop asking how we got so rich. Here's another story about racism. Go eat each other. 
That's the program. That's how most of us now live here in the United States. Manipulated by lies, silenced by taboos. It is unhealthy and is dehumanizing, and we're tired of it. As of today, we've come to Twitter, which we hope will be the shortwave radio under the blankets. We're told there are no gatekeepers here. If that turns out to be false, we'll leave. But in the meantime, we are grateful to be here. We'll be back with much more very soon.